Theros Beyond Death. Our, our first time back to Theros. Correct. The first return to Theros. The first return to Theros. Um, I do think that the set is looks good. Um, I don't think it's as powerful as Eldraine. Um, Agreed. Eldraine was ridiculous. Yeah, those adventure creatures. Uh, and I think that... But I do think that the set has a number of very interesting cards. Um, some of which I think uh, people are probably like not talking about as much. I mean, the obvious, we start with the temples. We only opened three of them. Um, but there's a red-black one and a red-green one in the set as well. Um, these lands are all extremely good. Uh, the, they come into play tapped, which is you know, a relevant downside. Um, but the scry one attached to them is way more impactful than a lot of people think. Um, in slower decks, you can legitimately play 12 temples. Um, here, I'm going to go ahead and show off like uh, two, two examples of them. That happens to be the blue-black one, and that's the green-white one. Um, I do think that these lands... I mean, the enemy-colored ones were already in the format, and so they printed the allied-colored ones in um, this one. Um, for those of you that do not know, um, when we refer to colors... Uh, the back of the card shows you what the enemy colors are and the allied colors are. Allied colors are colors that are next to each other, so white is allied to blue and green, um, and an enemy of black and red because those are the two cards at the opposite end of the pentagram. So we already had the um, enemy colored ones, and now we have the allied colored ones. Um, over the course of the next year, these are going to see a ton of play and be everywhere. And these were printed also in the original... Our first time to Theros? Correct. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the cards that excite us sure. from uh, Theros Beyond Death. Um, each color has a wrath effect? Uh, not each color. White and red have uh, wrath effects. We didn't open the red one, but the white one is Shatter the Sky. Um, it is a hard wrath at four mana. It's not conditional. Um, it blows up everything. Um, but the downside is that uh, typically uh, if you blow up a creature with four or greater, your opponent's going to draw a card. Um, if you have one of four or greater, you'll also draw a card. Um, given the types of decks that tend to use Wraths, this is a very significant downside. Um, I do think that overall uh, the white-black Kaya's Wrath is going to be better most of the time. Uh, and the reason for that being is that I think in this new format, black is going to bring a lot to the table, and you're often going to want to play it anyway. Um, I think Kea herself is going to be very good in this next format. Um, she deals uh, very proactively with escape. She gains you life. Um, she Her removal ability, the minus, uh, the minus ability, is relevant against tokens, as well as things like Witch's Oven and uh, Cauldron Familiar. Um, so I do think that she will end up in a place that where like having a couple copies in your deck will be very useful. Uh, combine that with the extra um, utility that black can get you with some of the spells. Um, and I think if you're playing a slower strategy, you often want to have access to uh, black mana anyway. Uh, and so you will likely often be using Kaya's Wrath over, um, over the Shatter of the Sky. Uh, but it is worth noting that if you aren't playing a black strategy, if you're going to go Bant, or you're going to just go straight blue-white, or you're going to go something along the lines of white-red, um, you may want to have access to Shatter the Sky because it is a very powerful effect. Um, having a Wrath at 4 mana is very important. Um, so uh, it's been one of the things that's been missing in uh, a lot of the constructed formats is the ability to clear the board at 4 mana. To turn 4, yeah. Um, I mean, in Wrath of God was kind of the OG 4-drop sorcery speed yeah they stopped doing it because i think they thought four mana rats were too strong day of judgment i think was the last one day of judgment was the last one and i think that it was true back when creatures were about as good as they were in like invasion block yeah right if your creatures are going to be substantially worse than clearing than clearing the board at four mana is probably a little too strong but given the power of modern day creatures and given the fact that planeswalkers exist um, four mana rats, I think, now are no longer like too strong. They are, in fact, necessary for healthy formats. Yeah, especially when the, the creature power creep has... Because they started designing creatures so that they couldn't be <coughs> bolted, yeah. you know, and or they couldn't be shocked the turn they came into play. So uh, having uh, unconditional removal is... That's always been a hallmark of white as well. Yeah. So very, uh, very on point. Uh, did you pull any uh, rares? I did pull some. That um, you uh, want to... So the three that I wanted to cover um, that I think are the most interesting from a constructed standpoint, um, the first one is going to be Uro. Uh, this card is ridiculous. 
uh, it like it is absolutely ridiculous. It's a three man explorer that gains you three life, um, wow. as well as like being a six six titan on turn four. Like Simic Ramp, like this card is this card is uh, this card is just amazing. Yeah, could you um, um, put a Uro and a uh, Croxo next to each other because they're because they're, they're all from the same cycle. Yeah, and they're very very similar. Uh, Croxo is one that I pulled that I was interested in. I'm not you know. It's not a 6-6 six, six for two, because if you didn't escape it, you have to sack it right away, unless you do some shenanigans. In Arena, someone had constructed a deck with that uh, three-drop white creature. Hushbringer? Yeah, Hushbringer. Um, so it was turn three, Hushbringer, turn four, 6-6 six, six for two mana, um, which is one way to cheat it out. I actually think it's more powerful if it has its trigger, yeah. if it has its Enter the Battlefield abilities. Um, I don't know if Uru is similar. Or you want to have it enter the battlefield. You want that ability to trigger. That's Absolutely, why you play it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I think, I think, I think um, this is the best of the cycle. Agreed. Um, and it, it's just, a, it's just really, really strong. Especially given how strong green is right now. Like that card is really, really strong. It's going to see a ton of play. It's green got a lot of love the last couple of years, huh? Yeah. So much love they had to ban some of it. So um, ban like half of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, this card, I think, is a card that um, that I like a lot. Uh, it is obviously like red green decks have historically um, been very aggressive um, and been very very good at sort of beating down. At a two two haste for two, it's a pretty good rate, um, and I think that it combos very well with uh, the red Chandra. Um, and so red green does have some support for kind of flooding the board right now and uh doing well so for example like this also combos fairly well with love struck beast yep because love struck beast is going to make that one one and then come down as a five five and so with one card you can get two guys um there are a number of uh ways of getting two guys off of one card so this can go ahead and draw you a card on a regular basis um combined with some of the good escape cards that are in red green um for example like the uh there's um <laughs> There's the five mana guy that like you exile eight cards and you draw three cards when it comes in. You discard your hand and draw three cards. Yeah. But, like what you're playing, it you're drawing three cards. Yeah. Please. <laughs> like you don't have any cards in your hand yeah. by the time you're playing that. So. So. What about? Isn't there? What's the riot? The the two drop riot go goblin Zerta goblin. Oh Zerta goblin. Do you yeah. think that this takes place? Of that, uh, do you think this pushes Zerta goblin out of those, uh, aggro, aggro gruel builds? It might very well. Um, I think that, like, you still have the thing where you want, like, your Pelt Collectors, and you're still going to want um, Love Struck Beast as a one-drop. Um, Edgewall Innkeeper uh, does put some constraints on what you can do. Uh, the main reason is because it's... Um, it's... It's just so... You need to play so many adventure cards in order for you to be able to, like, take advantage of Edgewall Innkeeper. But if you're not taking advantage of Edgewall and Keeper, if your plan is to gain advantage through like Domri and Chandra and some of the other good cards that are available to you in Red Green, uh, you may be able to do some kind of mid rangey thing with um, something like Galia to help you uh, to help you draw cards, um, and that might very well that might very well uh, very well be something that's interesting and and useful. Yeah, I mean and if the um, the Ravnica set rotates out, you still have a two drop hasty 2/2 two, two that does stuff. So I think that also the art on this card is just funny and great. Like that that's the other reason the art on this card is great. <sighs> um. <laughs> Look at this. She's got a guy in a headlock. She's so happy about it too and and not caring. Um, and while we're on, um, while we're in, in the gruel, um, that guy's interesting. The, uh, yes. Clothis. Uh, the, so all the gods are actually interesting. Well, do, well done <coughs> on the gods, guys. Um, most of the gods are, I think most of all the gods uh, do have some relevance. Um, I do think that they are less hilariously overpowered than the last set of gods. Um, uh, so, like, most of them are to the point where it's, like, like they're still useful. Um, the god that's probably the most overpowered, I think, is going to be Thassa. Um, and that's the god that I think overall is going to end up being um, being the craziest one. Um, and 
But, uh, you know, there's a lot of other good things that are going on. Um, the passives are just a little less strong, and which is nice. Um, and then I think uh, the the, the gruel the passive for the the gruel one there is uh, useful too even if it's not overpowered yeah um, so but they still uh, there's they followed the same format they're still all basically indestructible yeah and um, you need to meet a devotion requirement before they actually become a creature so yeah um, very very cool so I think that that card is interesting um, People have probably talked about this card a lot, but it's a card that's worth noting again. Um, Watch Wolf is by itself playable, just a flat 2-mana 3-3. Three, three. Um, this is going to be a, a card that um, is going to generate a lot of value because it's going to be difficult to kill because you can give it indestructible at will. Um, and then it also, like, even if it dies, it comes back. Yeah. So it comes back and it makes, you know, the next guy that you're going to put it on difficult to kill. Um so I think the Lion is going to be a card that's going to see a lot of play in these kind of like mid-rangey, mid-range aggro decks. Um, it's going to end up being quite strong. Uh, yeah. Um, um, another so. strong creature that could be difficult to deal with. Uh, is going to be the Phoenix, Phoenix the Red Phoenix. That'll yeah. definitely see play. Um, I think that uh, the fact that you can escape over and over again with this card um, gives it a, sort of a role, like, uh, you know, much... Because, like... If you imagine Arclight Phoenix, right? The problem with the Arclight the Phoenix, Phoenix decks, yeah. yeah. The problem with the Arclight Phoenix decks has always been if you don't draw Arclight Phoenix, the deck does nothing. Right? And so having this available to you as another thing that you can be doing with all the like uh, thirst for possibility, whatever it is, the two thrill of possibility. Thrill, yeah. yeah. Um, when you're putting like that and like um, and like all the lands and the like, not the faceless opt, looting, though, and, a, yeah, yeah, like the ops that you're putting in your graveyard, like all of those cards get exiled to make you, you know, to make you three three flyers or two sorry, two two flyers. Um, no, no, it is a three three flyer when it escapes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it makes you those like three three flyers, and it it's just gener it's going to generate a lot of value. Um, I don't know whether, like, the Arclight Phoenix strategy as a whole is still viable, um, especially given the amount of graveyard control that people are likely to be running. It also um, took a big hit in um, et the Eternal, in, like, Modern, when Faithless Looting was banned. You became mm -hmm. much less, because the whole point was to dump your dump your Arclights, cast spells, get your Arclights back, and, and when that became less consistent, you know, you, you really didn't see it getting played as much. Um, but this... This Phoenix... I think it could see some play in standard. In yeah, standard it'll see some decks. standard play. Um, um, I hope to draft it and then draft a red support around it because that's, that's just a fantastic card. So uh, the the escape mechanics is... I, but yeah. I hope we can, uh, get to abuse it somehow. But like that's that's a good card um, for just sort of doing, um, doing kind of like off-angle attack. Um, there's with, a, a, with, a man, with a pumping man with a power pumping yeah. mana dump too is good. Um, there's a cycle of interventions, um, which are all fairly good. I'll put those over there so they can see all four. Um, there are, of course, the red. There's a red one too that we. Uh, I don't know if you opened, but. Um, oh yeah, perforuses. Perforuses inter. Uh, perforuses. Yeah. Intervention. Um, so you know, there's there's five of them. Uh, they're all solid. Some of them are better than others. <coughs> I think the blue one for constructed, at least for standard, is going to end up being the best one, because it's the one where I think both modes are like r roughly even in terms of utility. Um, the black one I think could be pretty good because depend. It really depends more on how relevant the graveyard control aspect is. Um, mostly because uh, if people are doing a lot of escaping, if like that's a real relevant part of the metagame then the black one goes up in value because it allows you to control that pretty easily. Um, I think the white one's pretty bad for Constructed. Yeah, I mean, in block, um, it takes care of enchantments, which, it, you know, but uh, completely, other than that, completely agree. Um, the red one, the red one also is a pretty good raid on both ends. You can send a big dude at them to kind of just hit them for, for a little bit, or you can kill guy. Um, the red that one, sorcery speed, though, is, is a, yeah. it's, it's a huge kick. Uh, so the white is an instant, the blue is an instant. The green is a sorcery. And the black is an instant? The black is an instant. Or green and red. Um, 
I think the green one, like, the green one can, can work. I mean, it's, once again, land-themed, so, like, um, uh, you know, but, like, it, I don't know. It's, like, it's, like, it, it's just, like, the, the red one, the black one, and the blue one, I think, are relevant. Um, I like the blue one. I think the blue one will, the blue one's going to end up, uh, I have a blue-black commander deck, um, and I'm always looking for instant speed draw, because uh, it's a flash yeah. instant speed deck. I want that. And the fact that, like, I can take out a uh, inst- current instant speed draw X cards and put this right in there because it also has the added utility of being yeah. a count, an emergency counter. It's a terrible counter spell. It's actually not. It, but it, compared to uh, the instant speed or compared to what else I'm running in there, you know, my force of negation and force of will is probably Fair. a better, better counter spell. But if I can have my cake and eat it too, I'm going to be running Thassa's Intervention. Yeah, Thassa's Intervention, I think, will be useful in Standard. I'm not sure much outside of that. Like, none of these cards are really all that useful outside of Standard. But I think in Standard, um, uh, the Intervention Cycle, um, there's a good number of them that are useful. If you want a card that is not useful in Standard and useful in ridiculous formats, um, <laughs> we're going to talk about Underworld Breach. Um, this is a card that is probably terrible in Standard. Is this um, the uh, Escape this is the this everything is the, gets everything escape. Everything has escape. Yes, this is gonna um, get people in eternal formats and 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 EDH are going to brew the bejesus out of this card. Um, but this card's it's already probably been done. terrible in standard. Like, I don't know I, what it would come. Like what would it? There's no lion's eye diamond in standard. Like, but like your ability to like play this card and then be like escape my LED, escape my right of flame. Yeah. Like over and over yeah. and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Like, and just over and over again. Like, it's just utterly ridiculous. Like, if you think about something Escape like... Escape my Wheel of Fortune. Well, it's not even that. I mean, I just think of it in something like... Just think of it in something like Storm Decks. Yeah. Right? Like, you dump a bunch of stuff in your graveyard. Like, this might be better than Past in Flames. One might argue that to a certain extent, like, depending on, like, how you run... You probably want this in addition to Past in Flames. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I believe like, in a world where they exist together. <laughs> um... But like, um, but like, there are definitely situations where you'll be able to get a huge graveyard really quickly, and then you cast an underworld breach, and your opponent is just gonna die. Well, you can if you can escape like, zero cost artifacts, yeah, for zero, like, and then gen- generate mana off those artifacts. That's well, I mean, combos with paradoxical outcome too. But yeah. you know, paradoxical outcome is already a ridiculous card. Parad- so yeah, paradoxical it it combos with itself. <laughs> so. Um, so, you know, like, that's just kind of the way it is. But, like, this is a card that is probably going to have some impact in older formats and um, absolutely uh, and absolutely do well there. Yeah. But it's probably going to be terrible in standard. So if you're a standard player, you can safely ignore the fact that this exists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, notable uh, reprints. Um, Idyllic Tutor has been reprinted. Uh, a staple for any uh, enchantment based card uh, it's huge huge in anyone who plays white and, and commander um tutors tutors are there any other tutors not printed? in the format right no. now so just uh that i mean i think there's like probably a demonic tutor variant but like i'm oh, sorry it's like diabolic tutor variant as there almost always is yeah but like uh, other notable reprints that are going to impact standard are field of ruin hmm. um and gary's back the Grey Merchant. Uh, this is already uh, mono black devotion is already being brewed for standard right now because of Gary reprints. Um, I'm going to add Banishing Light to that list. Um, the difference between having an Oblivion Ring, which deals with any non land permanent, and Prison Realm, which only hits creatures and planeswalkers, is huge. Huge. Um, it is. It the difference between the two is night and day. Because you can Banishing Light um, a Banishing Light. Well, you can also banishing light like a trail of crumbs or a Nicol a citadel, yeah, Bolas' citadel. Like there are lots of powerful enchantments and artifacts that just aren't going to be hit, and and if your answer is not sufficiently flexible, it's very very hard to play a reactive strategy. Um, that's what I think a lot of people fail to understand is that the flexibility of you can have some some conditional answers in your reactive strategy, but at its core most of your answers need to be very flexible because that way you can place the conditional ones correctly. Yep. You can use your D-Spark when it needs to be used. Otherwise, you're going to use an Absorb or you're going to use a Banishing Light or something like that 
in order to go ahead and uh, work that way. So you need those unconditional answers. Um, and I think that's something that they have failed to understand recently. They have thought of stuff like prison realm as an unconditional answer. Trapped in a tower. Which it really isn't. Yeah. Like, it really just needs to say non-land permanent or target permanent or stuff like that. It needs to be that level of flexibility. I'm a big fan of being able to bounce lands um, or exile lands as well. So, um, and so I think that uh, Banishing Light will definitely matter. Um, and I so I think, like, and yeah, I'm going to add to Gary. I mean, obviously, uh, Gary being back is nice. Um, there are also a few, like, new prints in this set that I, I'm excited about um, in terms of, like, how it looks like they are coming around on the understanding the right answer suite. Um, I'm going to start with Whirlwind Denial. Um, this is a solid, uh, this is a solid counterspell um, because four mana is going to counter a lot of things at three. It's functionally not all that different from Cancel, uh, but one of the things that's nice is because it counters abilities on the stack. Yeah. Um, specifically, you can use it to counter Planeswalker activations if necessary, um, but the big one is going to be Hydroid Crisis. Um, one of the major problems was that Hydroid Pr Crisis was printed as a cast trigger and not an Enters the Battlefield trigger. I do think that card should have been printed as an Enters the Battlefield trigger. I think it's a little too strong as a cast trigger. Agreed. Because um, you because ca you can ca you you cast it and then even if it's countered you get you get the cards which is you what get you the cards in the anyway. life yeah um, which is what you cared about anyway and so like they're not being access to if for example disallow was still legal then maybe it would be less big of a deal but without the ability to deal proactively with the trigger which is actually in a lot of respects the more important part of hydroid crisis it, yeah playing hydroid um, crisis because I, I play it in a simic flash and it reminds me of sphinx's revelation and when yes but sphinx's revelation had to resolve yes <laughs> and was an instant you yes. know but uh, so you know, but it, it, the way that it the way that it functions in the deck is very much like sphinx's revelation where it's a towards the end of the game now, now what are you going to do? Because I just drew into a bunch of gas and put my life total out completely out of reach of you. So I think Whirlwind Denial is important for that reason. Um, <coughs> um, okay. I would like to see a little bit more for that. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about Thirst for Meaning, too. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, I put Thirst of mean for Meaning aside as well. We One of the first cards we mentioned to each other when we walked in was like, can't wait to play with Thirst of Meaning. I think just a solid instant speed draw spell. Having this next to Thirst for Knowledge um, would be really good. And I'm going to finish up real quick on Birth of uh, Miletus. This is a really good variant on the Wall of Omens and um, Wall of uh, Blossoms concept. Um, those cards have always seen strong play because a 2-mana 4 is a great blocker and providing you that card um, is always nice. Um, in this case, the card you get is a basic planes, but you also get two life out of it. So uh, I think this is a very strong card that's going to see a lot of play. And then lastly, I have Meyer's Grasp. Just to, once again, another solid two-mana removal spell. Uh, less conditional than... Sorry, than a lot of other things you'll see. Yeah, um, this set was very fun to play sealed. Uh, I get the feeling that it's going to be good to draft. Uh, last but not least, I know you're not a big fan of them, but a big buzz around this new set has been... The new full art lands, people are referring to them as energy lands because there's no land on them. It's kind of a um, celestial representation of the mana symbol itself, but I guarantee you some people are going to go uh, gaga over this, uh, uh, over this design uh, change. Um, I, I think they look good. Uh, they're not my favorite lands either. Um, I'm not going to be uh, going out of my way to purchase them, but... Uh, that's there, and they, they also, they do look, they look good foiled. Oh. Yeah, I think that's uh, Theros Beyond Death. Enjoy.